Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you. Hey, if you're new, I want to give just a warm welcome because we believe that you're family when you come into Fount. So I want you to turn to your neighbor because they could be new, and I want you to say welcome. Now turn to your other neighbor because that was your second choice and say welcome. Y'all are all welcome team. We're all putting y'all on welcome team. Hey, if I haven't got the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Kevin. Me and my wife, we actually have been in the church since 2017. And we met because I was serving on host team. She's always early. And she came in the doors and I was like, oh. (laughs) Two kids later, we are here. We're married. It's amazing, but all that to say, if you are new to Fount, get plugged into the local church. Uh, Not just for a wife and kids, although that is a benefit, but God moves in lives. And I can say that I am not the same kid that came in in 2017. I'm pretty unrecognizable, and it's all because of what Jesus is doing through the local church. So I want to encourage you, if you're just checking us out, if you're online and you're thinking about, hey, what should we do? Could I, could I find my fit here? I can say that you can. Not because we're a perfect church, but because we serve a perfect God. All right? Now, before we get into the Word, I am really excited to get into the Word because it's the Word of God. Now, I think sometimes we think about the Word of God and we, maybe we don't understand it, so we throw it away as a wisdom of old or wisdom that is not for this age, but I'm telling you that this is timeless. And so we're going to preach from the Word of God today. We're going to unpack the Scripture. We're going to meditate on the Scripture, and then we're going to activate our faith and respond to the Word. So I want you to join me in prayer before we dive in, all right? I I don't want my voice just praying. I want all of us praying. How about that, okay? So God, we thank you for what you're going to do through the word. Lord, we thank you, God, that we can't understand this without you. So Holy Spirit, would you move in our hearts? Lord, would you move in our minds? We thank you, God, that you came in flesh to show us yourself, to reveal yourself to us, for your glory, but also to love us. So will you do something special in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, we're in a new series today. It's our called Second Mile People. Can everybody say Second Mile? People. Now, it's all about the life of the early church. So we had the Resurrection Sunday. We had Easter. I saw all those amazing outfits. And now we are going to study the scriptures of what happened to the early church after Jesus ascends. And so this is all about a people group. They were always called, actually, followers of the way before they were called Christians. And their whole lifestyle was radical in transformation. They went from having fear to having power. They went from being quite lonely after Jesus uh, ascended to now coming out to people and going to all areas of the world and being sent. How did that happen? That's what we're going to be looking through these seven-week series. So I want you guys to lean in, and as today, we're going to talk about the Great Commission. The Great Commission is this beautiful part of scripture in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I'm gonna read it in a second. And this is almost some of Jesus' last words to his disciples before he ascended. Now, if we think about some of the last words you've heard from people that you love or people that have marked your lives and they, you have something rememberable from them that they've actually spoken to you or given to you, you know that it's important. So we're going to lean into the scripture as I read it. This is Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they doubted. 
And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God. Now, just a little bit of context before we dive into this. You see here that it says that now the 11 disciples, there were 12, but our friend Judas, he betrayed Christ. And that actually overwhelmed him. And that's just a word for all of us that sometimes sin is overwhelming. So much so that we think about hurting ourselves. We think about doing things that actually are destroying to us. But Jesus, he came to free us from the penalty of sin. And what he does in that is he takes the things that are trying to ruin your life and he frees us from it. Now, the 11 disciples, now they went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of these disciples 2,000 years ago. They saw their savior crucified. Capital punishment. And this would have been the worst capital punishment of the day. And now he's resurrected. But that comes with a, a lot of emotions, a lot of trauma, a lot of confusion. What's happening next? They've heard his words for three years. They followed his footsteps for three years. To be a disciple, they would have actually followed his way of living and tried to be like him. But when they saw him, they worshiped, but they doubted. I wanna encourage us today, and maybe you're in here and you're, you're, you feel like you're halfway in, you're halfway out. The 11 disciples that walk with Jesus for three years, they felt like that even after they saw him resurrect. So I wanna, I wanna encourage you that if you feel like you're in here and you just went through the worship songs, Hannah Ray was leading you so well, but you then feel like when you go home, I'm not sure about this whole thing. I'm not sure if Jesus is for me. I can't really know his character. I wanna encourage you not to draw yourself away from Jesus, but to actually bring your doubt to him. Even though they doubted, they went to Galilee. That would have been a long journey for them from Jerusalem, almost about 40 miles. We're not talking about Ubers, y'all. We're talking about they walking. And that's a lot of time to think about your trauma, think about your doubt, but to still let your feet move you towards Jesus. So I wanna encourage you too, if you're in here and it feels like sometimes, man, I just wanna get out, these church people are crazy. I want you to plant your feet here because there will be times when you're challenged and you're saying, oh man, I, I just gotta escape. But when we bring ourselves to the feet of Jesus, especially in the place of community, we are molded into what he wants us to be. So they worshiped him, but they doubted. And that word doubted in the Greek, it means double-minded. My prayer for us is that you release the thought that you have to change your double-mindedness, but that Jesus is gonna change it today. He could change it tomorrow. That's why you continue to bring yourself to him. It's not a salvation of works, it's a salvation of grace. The work of the believer is to believe. Sometimes that looks like showing up. Sometimes that looks like worshiping, but still feeling that doubt that's eating you away. 
Sometimes it just looks like just being at the place that Jesus told you to be. Funny story, when I first came to Fount, it was on a whim. I just had turned 25, I had a birthday, and the same things that I used to love just didn't taste the same. And I felt this heaviness. So I went walking and I prayed. I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I was stuck in so many cycles, so many different things of shame, things that I couldn't break off myself. And I felt so clearly in my heart that you need to go back to church. And it did not make sense, but that was the place that God wanted to meet me. And so even though I doubted, I was like, I'm gonna be there set my alarm, I went out before, but I did get there. (laughs) Sometimes faith is a journey, right? (laughs) Took a while for some of those things to just fall off of me. But that's my encouragement to y'all is to put ourselves in the same shoes as the disciples. Sometimes we read this and we're like, whoa, they were so faith-filled, but they were just like you. They were just like you. Now we go on to, to read in chapter 18, it says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I want you to say all authority. All authority. How beautiful that when they are worshiping, but then they doubt that Jesus does not approach their doubt. He brings himself and he says, all authority has been given to me. Our first point for today is to accept Jesus's authority. Now again, if we're thinking from the framework of where the disciples were right now, they were living in a place in a time where they're like, what do we do now? You've told us that we're going to actually be without you. You're going to leave, but they are living in a Roman occupied time. And so they thought that when Jesus came, that he would certainly overthrow all Roman occupation. It was going to be like 300. It was going to be Spartans. It was going to be the whole thing. Jesus came through. He kicked through the doors and it was over. But Jesus is saying all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Sometimes the authority of Jesus doesn't look like our movie picture. But it is the best thing for your spirit. It's the best thing for your heart. It's the best thing for your mind. How do I know? Because he went to the cross. He resurrected. And he's not just talking about right now. He's talking about eternity. We think limitly in our minds of the day to day. And we're like, well, God, my boss is doing this. Or my, my husband is doing this. And we think, whoa, what's the authority over that? But God thinks in times of eternity. He's talking about eternal authority. And sometimes the things that he allows perplex us humans. We're not really sure. I want us to accept that we do not know all the things that God knows. Now, maybe you're going through a really hard time right now. You're like, God, I really need you to deliver me from this depression. Maybe you're going through a really hard time and there's mental illness in your family or there's someone that needs to be healed. Maybe you've already lost a loved one and you're like, God, why did you, why, if you have all authority, why did that happen? I want you to bring that to the feet of Jesus. He's got the best things for you. He mourns with those who mourn. He celebrates with those who celebrate. And 
and he knows. He knows what has what has went on in your life. He knows what the grief that the 11 disciples would have felt, the confusion. They also just scattered and sinned and all the things and cursed him. And now they're coming back. He knows all these things. Yet he says all authority. I want you to actually in this moment Go ahead and close your eyes for a second. And Lord, I pray right now that you would actually just bring to the forefront of every single person's mind something that they believe you don't have authority over. And as you're bringing that thing to their mind, Jesus, I pray that you would show them your authority. Oh, it's an authority that is loving, it's kind, yet it's powerful. Lord, I pray right now that the peace of God would enter into this room as we accept your authority. I sense that people are seeing things even from childhood and you're like, why did that happen? I want you to remind you that God is a God of justice. Every evil thing is under his feet, is defeated. It no longer has power over you, except his authority. We give you praise, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Before we move on from this point, I do want you guys to think that even Jesus has authority over your life to free you from sin. Some of us, maybe we feel like God can't use me. He does not know what I've done. He does not know what I've been through. He does not know where I've walked. He does not know what I've thought. All these things the disciples would have probably been thinking after they deserted him, after they cursed him. Jesus has authority over your sin in your life. The things that you feel like ruin you, the things that no one knows, and I want you to give them to that. Now this next point says, go therefore. Before we move on, I just want you to say go. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now this is our reaction to the fact that God has all authority and he's given all authority to Jesus. Now, if we are here and we say, hey, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower of Jesus, this is for you. This isn't for just the person that is in full-time ministry. This isn't for the evangelist. This isn't for the person that just goes to another country. This is for you. This is for your workplace. This is for your family. This is for the people that are outside these doors. So I want us to all think about this is for me as I'm reading this and we're breaking this down. Now that go, therefore, that's your first step. I want you to think about where you are going. Where's Jesus sending you? There could be just in your family. 
Maybe he wants you to start there. It could be in your workplace. When it says all nations, for the disciples' context, that meant people that were not Jewish. It was time for them to take this word and let it spread throughout the world. But for your context, that, that word all nations, it means cultural differences. Maybe there's someone around you that you don't align with. How can we actually love them and make disciples? What does disciples mean? It means to be a learned one. To actually sit at the feet of Jesus and learn what he has taught. If we're being honest, maybe you've built, we've built our faith off the faith of our parents or the faith of myths, or maybe you said, you know what? A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of astrology, a little bit of culture, a little bit of Instagram, a little bit of all that, and I think that, that's what I like. That's what I feel good about. But this says to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What the doctrine of the Trinity means is the one true God. And what I'm telling you is that today in culture, many people are, will try to tell you that there are many gods. There's many ways to the Father. Jesus says there's only one, it's me. And so baptizing someone is not just a physical act, although it is a declaration of faith. If you're thinking about, hey, I want to take a step of faith, May 19th, we're going to have baptisms. I would love to see you there because it will be something that when you immerse yourself in the water, you're actually taking a step of faith to say in front of everybody, I'm a new creation. And that, that is powerful. It's not just an image. It is a spiritual transformation. But also baptizing means immersing. So I want to encourage us. It's okay if we felt we've, hold on, we've held on to things of, of our youth. Or we've held on to, to things that felt like it made us comfortable Jesus is wanting to be your one and true God. I know all y'all felt that earthquake. <laughs> I'm telling y'all right now, I've never been in an earthquake. And when I felt that thing, I was like, Jesus, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm ready. But when you felt that, Tell me that you did not, what did you think about when you felt that? When we feel the Lord's power, when we feel his things, our, our thinking gets very, very matter of fact. And I want to ask us now, there's sometimes we have so many, so many things in America, so much space so much time, so many choices. But I'm telling you right now, I want to ask you, if that was the time, what would you be thinking about? And I would want to say, I gave my life to the one and true God. I would want to say that, Lord, I didn't have it all figured out, but I trusted you and I had faith in you. And I know this because you freed me from my sin. And it's not just for eternity, it's for right now. So I'm going to live my life on fire for you. And I'm going to use my authority, my life, my gifts, my talents to say you are God. And maybe you don't know what that looks like in your context. 
Maybe you want to start by just saying, God, teach me to know that you are the one true God. And maybe you're at the place where it's talking about teaching others that there's one true God. It's not gifts. It's not talents. It's not a little bit of sprinkled of this and that. It's one true God. The next is teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. This is a part of the Great Commission. First, you need to go. Second, you need to make disciples by immersing them into one true God. And third, you need to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Think about all the words that Jesus spoke to the disciples. He's asking us today in our context, when we make disciples, that we teach him not our opinions, not our thoughts, but we teach them the word. Now, this will challenge us because when I read this in the morning at 530 every day, sometimes I'm like, God, I don't get this. And this feels like you're against me. That's because we have a hold on sin sometimes too. And what he's doing is as we go out and disciple others, he's discipling us. So if you feel stagnant in your journey, I would encourage you. We're going to have Bibles at our need prayer station. And if you don't have one, I would encourage you go pick up a Bible because God wants to disciple you. He wants you. He wants to teach you. He doesn't want you to stay stagnant. He wants you to look more and more like him. The only way you're going to do that is immerse yourself in this. And maybe if you're ready to teach others about it. And it's obeying everything. That's challenging to me. There are some things that I'm like, oh, I'm going to skip over that today (laughs) when I read that. Maybe that's the thing that we have to sit on. Can I challenge you not to just move on? That's the space that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's the Spirit of God. Now, when Jesus ascended, he sent his Holy Spirit to every believer You have access to him. He's not a cloud. He's not a myth. He's a person that wants to live inside of you. And he wants to help you grow in this faith. You're not alone. I'm just calling out the lie that you are not alone. And that is to our third point. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You are not alone. Maybe you've been in a church before and it felt like it's rules, it's regulations, it's all the things that I can't do. Yes, you cannot do them. But they didn't tell you, but you have the Holy Spirit to help you do them. You have God himself willing to walk with you day in, day out, to love you, to care with you, to say you don't have to do it alone you know how comforting this would have been to these disciples not only were they in a Roman rule but they were about to go into a season where many of them most of them would die for Christ but they remembered that he is always with them. I want you to remember the authority of Jesus when you're going through tough times. Because this is the person that you're going to spend eternity with. That time will fade. Even if it ends in death, that time will fade. Jesus defeated death that time will fade. The Holy Spirit just put this on my heart that uh, there is a big fear of death 
over my family for a long time. My, my father, he's experienced so many deaths. He's one of nine, but he only has three siblings left. And so it started with his oldest brother when I think he was probably around eight or seven. And he prayed to God that he would heal him because he got hit by a car. His oldest brother was 16 at the time. And God didn't. feel right now to tell y'all that death is not the end and there's many things I can sense it in this room that you feel that is death over you because that's what sin is the wages of sin is death Jesus wants to be with you for eternity For me is I used to have night terrors. I used to have these night terrors that it felt like I would think about heaven and I would think about Jesus, but I would think about death. And one day I went to do this, went to go to sleep and I started getting this night terror and I started to panic. And I felt this still small voice say, that is not my voice. you are going through I'm just reminding you that that is not his voice if there's death attached to it it's not this journey with Jesus is hard guys we wouldn't choose it by our own flesh but it chose us Jesus loves you so much that he chose you and he wants to choose you today if you let him So with every eye closed, every head bowed. Lord, I thank you for this morning that we just get to worship you. The one and true God, the one that has all authority, God, not politics, not government systems, not dominions, not powers, but you, Jesus, the one that is just, the one that is both loving and merciful and grace-filled. You have all authority. And I thank you, God, for what you're going to do right now. Because there are people in here that you have held back your life from Jesus because you weren't sure about his authority. I want to give you an opportunity to say, I accept the authority of Jesus. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. And that's for you if you feel any doubt if someone were to ask you am I a disciple of Jesus do I follow Jesus do I give my whole life to him and you would have any hesitation this moment is for you to say I don't know what this looks like but I'm going to receive God to help me 
give my life to Jesus. So I'm going to count the three, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Everybody's eyes are closed. My eyes are open because I want to pray specifically for you. One, two, three. Beautiful. There's hands all over this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. People committing to you. People saying yes to you. Thank you. I thank you for these bold lives. We're just going to linger here for if, if there's any other people that says, hey, I need to give my life to Jesus. I see your hands. I see your hands. Thank you, Lord. Beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Now, we're all going to pray a prayer to receive this God because we're family. And so as one prays, we all pray. So I want you to repeat after me. Lord, I receive you. I am a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. I no longer hold my life, but I give my life to you. Help me live this life with the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Beautiful. We can stand to worship. Let's give Jesus a praise for what he did tonight, today. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all authority, all reign, all rule. We just worship you. We worship you, God. to go next with it. Part of that, first part, get in community, dinner parties. All right, join it on the app. We'd love to get you connected. 
This Wednesday, we have an amazing opportunity to worship together with All In. Make sure you're there. But that homework is to pray and to read, just that. And let the Holy Spirit move you, but also don't do it alone. We'll see you back next week, guys, 10 and 12. Same times, 10 and 12. We love you, church. See you online. Thank you so much for joining us for service today. If you're in New York City, we'd love to see you at one of our locations, whether it's in Manhattan or Brooklyn. We'd also love to see you get connected through social media or dinner parties. Dinner parties are the life of our church. They're like community groups, but with dinner and a party. It's where we have fellowship, have food, and talk about what we're learning. It's a great time to find community. You can find the closest dinner party to you by getting the Together app, typing in your zip code, and finding a dinner party right in your neighborhood. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great day, and we'll see you next week.